Hello friends, welcome back to Prosto Hub after a short break. I'm really sorry that I was not able to upload any of the videos as I was busy in preparation of my exams at the Australian Dental Council. So I've just completed my theory exams last week and now I shall be replying to all your mails and comments and thank you so much for waiting patiently for my second session on this topic mandibulectomy. So let's begin. So let us see the contents. So in the last session, we have discussed a till diagnostic considerations. And in this session, we shall be focusing on surgical reconstruction post mandibulectomy. So before getting into the topic, I request every one of you to please do like and share my videos among your friends. And to those who are new here, I'm Dr. Jolsna. And through this channel, Prosto Hub, I discuss some of the important prosthodontic topics that you may find useful for your MBS university exams. And one more thing, if you have any doubts or you have any queries or topic suggestions, you can either comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail ID. So let's get into the topic. In the previous session, we have discussed the main important goals of surgical reconstruction is to restore the form and function. So during surgical reconstruction, the reconstructive surgeon tries to re-establish the pre-operative functions and also facial aesthetics in order to allow the patient to return to as much as a normal family and social life. And this approach includes placement of dangers or osseo integrated implants to help shape the face and to assist with mastication and verbalization. Now let us see the important goals of surgical reconstruction. Criteria for a successful mandibular reconstruction are to establish the continuity of the mandible and also to establish the adequate alveolar height, the arch form, the arch width, so that it will help us for a much easier prosthetic rehabilitation. And also the surgeon should maintain bones as much as possible and also if you are placing the grafted bone it should be placed as close as to the original native mandible and we should try to maintain the aesthetics by improving the facial contours. Next coming to the cardinal prerequisites of successful bone grafting which was outlined over 40 years ago by Kazan Jian and is of still of paramount importance today. So the important prerequisites are the bone transplantation into healthy tissues. There should be wide contact between adjacent bone and the graft and the recipient area should be with adequate blood supply and there should be a positive fixation and the also stabilization of bone with the help of reconstruction plates, screws, etc. Now the reconstructive options include reconstruction plates and screws then the non-vascularized bone grafts, which are actually a subclassification of autogenous graft, where the graft solely depends on the recipient's vascularity and is usually indicated in defect sizes of less than 6 cm. Then the vascularized free flaps, which has got its own blood supply, and also the recent advances like medical modeling, where a three-dimensional model is being fabricated prior to the resection, and uh, transport disc distraction osteogenesis where a segment of bone is cut adjacent to the defect and moved gradually across the defect by a mechanical device then the tissue engineering etc construction plates and screws which are the most widely used alloplastic devices for mandibular reconstruction so the most common metals used in fabrication of these plates include stainless steel vitalium and titanium and uh, the main advantage of these reconstruction plate is that it provides adequate stability for osseous healing and also newborn formation. And one of the disadvantage of reconstruction plate is that they can result in higher maximum stress value when compared to that of mini plates, which are actually reconstruction plates, which are less than two millimeter in diameter. Whereas these reconstruction plates are actually at a diameter of greater than two millimeter. Next, the non-vascularized bone grafts, which are used for defects of mandible less than 6 cm in length with little or no loss of soft tissue. So here the bone graft is placed in a well-vascularized bed and the edges and bone fragments are stripped of periosteum so that adequate bone-to-bone -bone contact is established. 
and the common donor sites for non-vascularized bone grafts are the rib and iliac crest. And this allows for an easier reconstruction with higher functional success and also it creates a better contour and bone volume for facial aesthetics and also subsequent implant insertion. Vascularize the free flap which allows for healing independent of a compromised recipient bed. So they have got their own blood supply and doesn't depend upon a nutrient bed. And uh, here the important or the common donor sites include fibula, scapula and ileum. And the donor site flaps have different characteristics depending upon the length of the vascular pedicle, the quality, quantity, availability and length of bone, soft tissue skin paddle and also possibility of osteotomy. And a free fibula flap is the most commonly used and is considered to be the gold standard in mandibular reconstruction with a good success rate. So it has got a property of matching the jaws with its length structure which allows for reconstruction of maxilla as well as mandible after extensive bone resection and it can also be harvested as a single flap therefore permitting bulk replacement of bone and soft tissue. Currently a variety of implantable materials are available to aid in mandibular reconstruction. Most commonly used one is the hydroset which is a calcium phosphate cement which converts in situ into hydroxy epitide which serves as an effective osteoconductive and osteointegrative material. Other options include customized 3D printed implants which consist of 75% methyl methacrate styrene copolymer. Then Tideman et al has described a titanium mesh system for mandibular reconstruction where a custom made titanium tray was designed to match the segment of mandible to be resected and fixed it to the residual segments. So here autologous cancellous bone blocks were inserted into this titanium tray to reconstruct the mandible in the desired position and shape. And also the bone morphogenetic protein which is a reason advantage which has been a crucial step in the development of synthetic bone grafts. Rehabilitation segment. So first we shall be discussing about partially edentulous patients. So we know that the prognosis of a removal process is quite variable with patients uh, having resection of tongue and mandible. In some patients only aesthetics can be improved whereas in others improved mastication can be achieved. And in most of the patients where anterior teeth are not involved in the resection, the patients prefer not to wear a removable prosthesis because of the risk of radiation caries and osteoradionecrosis. And also since partial dangers can complicate oral hygiene, they may be contraindicated if there are a few teeth to replace and also if aesthetics and mastication are not major considerations. And while restoring, the primary determinant of prosthetic rehabilitation is usually related to occlusion. And a prosthodontist should ensure that all conventional restorative procedures have been completed and also the mandibular guidance therapy should be completed and occlusion should be acceptable before a definitive processes treatment should be beginning. So first we'll discuss about partially edentulous patient which is the category that includes patients with a lateral resections where anterior teeth are still present. So here while fabricating a removable processes we know that the occlusal rest that direct the occlusal forces along the long axis of the teeth the guiding planes which are employed to enhance the stability and bracing and also the retention must be within the limits of physiologic tolerance of the periodontal ligament and maximum support we have to gain it from the adjacent soft tissue. So these retainers, minor connectors, proximal plates, everything should be designed so that they do not exert excessive lateral forces on the remaining teeth during function. And one more thing to note is that here the arc of closure of the mandible is quite different from that of non-surgical patients. When you view from a frontal plane, the closure is angular rather than vertical, which produce forces of occlusion that are entirely unilateral and which is confined exclusively to the non-resected side. And this will cause the resected side to drop down of, drown out of occlusion as the force of contraction on the unresected side is increased. So the location of the fulcrum line is also difficult when compared to that of non-surgical patients. So in such situations we make use of altered cast impression technique 
which is the most commonly used one for mandibular distal extension partially edentulous arches where there is high chance that the free end saddles can be displaced under occlusal pressure because of the high displaceability of the mucosa. So the altered cast technique can be used here in order to prevent the high displaceability and here we make an impression of the mucosa under controlled pressure and this is highly recommended technique in order to capture details of the buccal, lingual and labial contours of the residual tissue and it also help us to accurately develop the contours of the final processes which contribute significantly to the stability of the processes. Now let us see the steps of this altered cast technique. So this is the uh, final metal framework that you have fabricated and once the fit of this framework has been um, verified intraorally as well as on the cast, you can attach a uh, acrylic resin custom tray onto the mandibular metal framework. And then the usual steps of border molding and the final impression has been recorded. And once this is done, the cast is split into two parts. And then the metal framework with the final impression is adapted onto this split cast. And then you get the altered cast. So this technique is also called as a split cast technique or a corrected cast technique. It's actually a modification of functional impression through laboratory procedure. I hope you have understood this technique. And it is a very important topic. You can expect this as a short note under your RPD section. If you want a separate session on altered cast technique in detail, you can comment below this video. So in the altered cast impression, we have to make sure that the lingual extension of the unresected side is recorded properly. This enhances stability and retention. And also maximum soft tissue coverage is always attempted. And the coverage of the buccal shelf on the unresected side will maximize support. And uh, we can also extend the impression into the soft tissue on the resected side or even beyond the soft tissue. This may provide cheek support and also prevents the formation of the facial concavity that is secondary to loss of bone and soft tissue. Thus it enhances aesthetics. Now after uh, making the cast, now the next step is jaw relation. So centric occlusion jaw relation record has to be made and this has to be made with the wax softened and under minimum pressure. And we have already told that the arc of closure is angular in this case. That is when the force of contracture on the unresected side increases, the mandibular rotation in the frontal plane will result in the resected side moving downward out of occlusion. But this phenomenon is actually impossible to correct. And uh, this movement actually does not result in any deflective occlusal conduct. And since the mastication is performed on the non-resected side, this movement is expected and also accepted. Now the next step is selection of denture teeth which is uh, based on the configuration of the opposing dentition and after trying and during the trying aesthetics, occlusion and speech should be evaluated and then the processes are processed, polished, delivered and adjusted and then the patient is placed on a recall system for periodic monitoring. So this is how the conventional removable partial danger has been fabricated for a hemimandibulectomy patient. And if there is a severe trismus present in such patients, we can reduce the vertical dimension so that it facilitates insertion of bolus between the teeth. Next, coming to anterior defects, which is the category that includes patients with anterior resection where mandibular continuity has been re-established by reconstructive surgery. So here there is extensive anterior edentulous area forming a Kennedy class 4 partial danger situation. And in such cases, usually the posterior occlusion is rarely altered and mandibular movement is usually normal. And uh, here you can go with conventional removal partial tension treatment. And uh, usually they may uh, display occlusal abnormalities if there is graft contracture or if there is inaccurate positioning of the mandibular fragments. So with conventional RPDs, you can enhance the aesthetics, provide support for the lower lip and cheek and also improved articulation of speech and also enhancing the control of saliva. If there is a small defect where canine has been retained, mastication is effectively restored leading to a much better prognosis. Whereas in larger defect, masticatory efficiency is compromised because of the length and movement of the anterior edentulous section leading to compromised mucosal support. You can also consider placement of implants in the symphysal region in such defects. 
retained and supported by implants placed in the anterior region of mandible combined with remaining posterior teeth allow most of the patients to masticate effectively. So usually these patients have good tongue function and the issue is the lack of support that impairs effective incision and mastication of food. So this support will be provided by the osteointegrated implants thereby there is effective incision and mastication of food into bolus. The successful implant placement, at least 10 mm of vertical bone should be available. And so, the uh, similar bulk of bone is required for grafted mandibles. And implants can be placed in residual bone or free grafts. And uh, bone grafts associated with free flaps, particularly the fibula, that is with the prominent cortical plates, when properly engaged, provide excellent stabilization for the implants. And another major challenge encountered while placing implant is the uh, creation of thin attached keratinized tissue around the implant. So usually the defects restored with free bone grafts present with an excess of soft tissue overlying the graft. So these bulky soft tissues should be carefully thinned and attached to the periosteum. So ideally the thickness of the tissues adjacent to the implant should not exceed 3 to 4 mm. And if the tissues are not thinned sufficiently, there is chance for formation of deep peri-implant pockets that predispose to infection leading to peri-implantitis. And uh, usually removal overlay processes are preferred for restoring these anterior defects and support for mastication is provided by implants anteriorly and by residual dentition posteriorly. And the danger flanges can be condored to reposition and support the lower lip and also this access for oral hygiene is easier for the patient. So if an implant supported processes is preferred, and if the edangular space extends into the molar region, a minimum of four to five implants must be placed. And when the bone sites are sufficient for longer implants, that is 13 mm or greater in length, only two implants are required to restore most defects. And the proper arrangement of implants is very critical. The arc of curvature of the arrangement must result in at least a one centimeter anterior posterior spread. This will enable the processes to withstand forces of mastication. So you know what is an anterior posterior spread. It is a distance measured from the most anteriorly placed implants to the posterior one. So greater the AP spread, greater is the stability of the processes. And uh, uh, also the buccolingual position and angulation of the implant is also important. Implants should be positioned so that the screw access channel exit through the singular area of the anterior teeth and the central fossa of the posterior teeth. So all these should be taken care while placing implant and giving a implant supported processes. Implants can also be placed in lateral defects if the bone volume permits and if the anterior mandible is edangulous. In such cases, two or more implants can be placed in this region and these osseo integrated implants can improve retention, stability and support of the RPD. Now, the myocutaneous flaps have been introduced and uh, this helps the reconstruction of defects with high predictability. Recent data says that implants can be placed into either free grafts or free flaps. And the factors that determine whether implants can be placed into these grafts is based on the status of the motor and sensory innervation on the defect side. Usually the lingual and hypoglossal nerves are frequently sacrificed during the resection of tongue or uh, lateral floor of the mouth tumors. Next is the prosthodontic rehabilitation of edangulous patients, which we will be continuing in our next session. Thank you all for watching this session. I request everyone to please do like and share my videos among your friends. And if you have any queries or feedbacks, you can either comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail ID. So it's a bye from Prosthahub until our next session. Thank you all.